show is a part of the Quite the Thing Media Podcast Network. Hey everybody, this is Kim and Kelly. And you're listening to Shiny Things. Hooray, we're back. We're back and we're excited. Putting the bad luck of the beginning of the year behind us. Moving forward. It was something, wasn't it? It was... It was a little bit um, trying the last couple months. Yes, I feel like we were. And it, so when I say this to people, they look at me strange. And I was like, no, when Kim's dealt a blow, I'm dealt a blow. And when I'm dealt a blow, Kim's dealt a blow. Because we're partners in crime in this. And they yeah. I kind of get like sideways looks. I was like, you just don't yeah. get it. You know, they don't get it because it, they don't get it because they don't have that, you know? It's, and that's sad that you don't have that kind of relationship with somebody. But that's how we are. I mean, that's what happens when you get close to somebody. Right. You take on their problems. So our little shiny things family, we're, we're putting positive vibes out into the universe. When you put out what you get back, hopefully. That is, that's totally my plan. <laughs> and karma. Yeah, be a real bitch when it wants to be. So let's put everything positive out there. Yes. I'll wait. I know karma takes a while because I've been waiting like eight years for some good stuff <laughs> on certain people. My on my list, the top of my list. <laughs> you know what's so funny? I used to well when we were allowed to go on vacation. If somebody like rub me the wrong way or somebody didn't have good customer service i'd always say um that's it i'm putting them on my list <laughs> right and so throughout the vacation lauren or frank would say you're gonna put them on your list you're gonna put them on your list and it will yep i am i uh-huh. have a big long list they're already on it they're on it <laughs> and as soon as i get home and have the time i'm reporting them <laughs> And you, I, I did, too. There's no place for sad sack people in customer service. Exactly. I completely agree. So the mean old lady at the Lowe's that works over here, I'm just like, why are you guys putting her in customer service? And I told the store manager that. <laughs> in you know, front of her. But sort of like <laughs> teachers. If, if you don't like children, why are you teaching? Right. I know that I can't deal with other people's children. Therefore, I don't teach. <laughs> funny. But I thought it'd be cool to do, like, a true crime news little thing in the beginning. Because a lot of times there's these really cool true crime stories that you and I share with each other. Oh, yeah. And they seem like there's they don't get a lot of news coverage, but last week I had found, so they found 20 people dead on a boat that was just kind of drifting in Turks and Caicos. Now, was this a boat that, that was reported missing, like, a while ago, or? So that's the the thing. So um, the article I found, they were they found it drifting about a mile off the Grand Turk Island and had twenty dead people on board, including two kids. Um, officials said investigators had ruled out foul play, but were still trying to determine what happened. The identities and the origins of the dead were still under investigation. Fishermen spotted the small boat Thursday morning and alerted the marine branch of the Royal Turks and Caicos Islands Police Force. So, yeah, this little boat just kind of drifted or They're not calling it foul play or anything like that. Um, there haven't been any updates, so I'm hoping next week there might be a, an update. But apparently, a couple time uh, back in 2019, they found a boat hearing about 158 people and then they found a boat in June of last year and it um the, I guess the captains you would call them they were um accused of human trafficking so oh wow maybe it's something like that but I thought that was very very weird and bizarre that they did you think we can do a um 
an update next week? I'm hoping. I'm going to keep my eyes peeled. So that, that would be cool. Okay, cool. That just sounds kind of intriguing. Oh, I was so really intrigued. So what are we going to talk about today, though? Today we're going to talk about the coin shop killer. Okay. Well, I never heard of him before. I hadn't either, but on ID, they have the show Evil Lives Here, which you all know. I, yeah, I've heard that, and that's one of your favorites. Oh, I love that show. So, they had the coin shop killer's daughter on. So, I was like, wow, this is really interesting, and I've never, ever heard of this. So, I decided to kind of do a deep dive into that, and it was it was pretty interesting, and it also... This is kind of one of those cases where technology finally caught up and helped out police, so. Well, that's a good thing. It just was too little too late, but, That's you know. usually how it happens, but, you know, at least they have some closure. Right. So, during 1980 and 1990, there were a string of these awful murders in coin shops throughout the western half of the U.S., uh, the culprit would go in, shoot the, gun, the shop owner or the dealers, leaving them for dead and stealing thousands of dollars in rare coins. Since the crimes were all in different states or counties um, and towns, things like that, they were all being investigated as individual deaths. So eventually, the different crime agencies started investigating the crimes as a serial killer um, that they would deem the coin shop killer. Okay, I get that. It makes sense. Right. Like, it's not a real super inventive name, but, you know, it works. So, the coin shop killer was actually Charles Thurman Sinclair. He was born in New Mexico in November of 1946, and he was the youngest of four. Um, his dad died when he was young, which left his poor mom to have these four kids and she had to operate a laundromat and also she would iron clothes just to make ends meet but throughout his childhood he had this interest in coins and he would collect rare coins and things like that so in the 1970s he started his own coin shop in Hobbs New Mexico with his own collection okay so he opened the store during the boring enough <laughs> right that's what I'm like oh. Each their own, but I'm like, hey, I don't know. Not my thing. <laughs> he had other things in mind, though, apparently. Although, to coin, people who like coins, it's probably like us walking into a jewelry store. Yeah, you're probably right. Like, ooh, look at all these shiny things. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> but, like, as the shop was open, so, like, during the tenure of the shop, he expanded its merchandise to hunting rifles collectible guns, and even some automatic weapons. So, well, I, that, that's, sorry, but that sounds kind of weird to have with, um, coins, rare, rare coins. <laughs> right, like, I'll take that, uh, 1885 quarter, and, uh, mind you throw that AK-47 in. <laughs> I'll round up a little bit. Right. Or, how about I trade you my two, you know, 1,700 pennies, <laughs> <laughs> for that, you know, handgun. Oh, God. That's funny. So, yeah, but it, so he started in the 70s, and then in 1985, the shop burned to the ground. Was it um, questionable? or? Yeah, the police were pretty suspicious about arson. It was investigated as an arson, but no one was ever charged. Hmm. So, but once the bills started coming due, because I don't, it doesn't sound like he had insurance and he really didn't want to give up his guns and the things that did survive the fire, which makes me do the little emoji with the, hmm, you know, hmm, like, yeah. So he was like, eh, we're just going to up and move to Alaska. So they go from New Mexico to freaking Alaska. <laughs> he takes it's his wife. Logical, Kelly. Right? It's like, you know, the the environment's nice. You know. Yeah, and there's no temperature change, really. <laughs> no. It'd be like us going to Canada. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> it 
in the middle of January. <laughs> so, so once they got up there and they're all situated in Alaska, and this is what like where his daughter's interview kind of came in. She would say, you know, he would travel a lot, and she knew that he had a business in rare coins, but you know, neither one of their parents worked per se. But he would always come home with money. Hmm. So, you know, here he is. He's traveling for a couple weeks at a time, things like that. So while he, you know, ran to Alaska um, before they had left, his wife in New Mexico, Debbie, was accused of embezzlement after failing to turn over um, 300000 pounds of in hunting and gear and fishing licenses and the fees that they had stolen from the store oh that's not good right so So it's kind of with the irs right and it's kind of like you know how i think of the new york lotto where you can only use cash so it's like where they they were probably just pocketing the money probably they probably had a separate little stipend for for what they were going to keep Right. So they were like, hey, here's your license, and they pocketed the money. Here in New York, that wouldn't fly, because no. you know how they like to put barcodes and numbers and all kinds of crap on yeah. licenses. So shortly after this, um, Sinclair started telling his friends that he was done working six days a week and start wanted to start a new venture, and perhaps go into real estate but that never happened he wanted he told him he wanted to stop working and yeah go into some, but he wasn't really working anyway exactly mm. so you know at this point they were in alaska and she got extradited back to new mexico but she pled not guilty and was released on bail and that's about all i could find for uh for that Hmm. So, how Sinclair became the coin shop killer? He had a very specific way that he would commit his crimes. He'd travel a lot to the coin shop. He'd go and introduce himself and make conversation about coins. You know, much like your little hobby shops and things like that. Because mm-hmm. they, you know, they're not franchised. It wasn't like coin stop. <laughs> like, yeah. So he'd go, and he'd spend a couple of days. He'd visit the shop a bunch of times, pretending to be interested in making a purchase. So this way, he would kind of get a reading on the coin shop people, like the whoever owned the place, who worked at the place, just kind of see what their traits were and their habits of the owners were. And it also helped them build trust. So that way, he could be there, like, when the store is closing and actually commit the crimes so i mean that was kind of clever i guess scummy but clever so his first victims were in 1986 um they're robert and dagmar linton they were a married couple they had just retired and they were on their way to do a road trip to vancouver because they wanted to go to the world's fair Uh uh-huh So their red and white trailer was found empty at a campground in Washington State. The camper um, had been, the couple had been traveling from Lodi, California towards the uh, World's Fair. During the first month of the trip, they kept calling and checking in with the family and all that kind of stuff. But once they reached Washington State, the, the call had stopped. So they found the couple's truck which um, was actually at the Seattle-Tacoma airport. When the truck was investigated, they found a small amount of blood, and the blood that was discovered had three types, one for Robert, one for Dagmar, and the third was an unknown person. Oh. So now we have the trailer and the truck. So once they put two and two together, inside the trailer, when you open it up, there was evidence that there had definitely been a struggle. 